Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show 1,896. Buckle up because today we're back at the Carrera Panamericana race. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah! Today I'm in beautiful Denver, Colorado, with a very special guest by the name of Jeff Mason. You might recognize that last name. We'll talk about that in a minute. Jeff, welcome to Cars Yeah! Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? Hey, Mark. Great to be with you. I am absolutely ready to release the clutch. Yeah, almost a silly question for a guy like you and your brother, Chris Mason, who's been a guest on the show here. Before I give you a proper introduction, what's one little thing that most people don't know about you, Jeff? I would never, ever put ketchup on a hot dog. <laughs> I wouldn't either. I don't know why people do that. <laughs> Ugh, it doesn't work. What's the deal with that? Uh, can't Now, I got to ask you this. How about a hamburger? Oh, absolutely. Uh, oh, oh, without question. I can't do that either. My wife. Oh, yeah, really? She does both, but I can't. No, got to be mustard. Yep. Oh. Yeah, better better yet Dijon, but uh, yeah, got to be mustard. I just can't do it. And I like ketchup. Good for French fries and other things, but no, can't do it. Oh, you've really got the plate divided then. I, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Crazy. I want it a little too tight, some people tell me. So uh, oh, maybe well. I need to loosen up a little bit. Very interesting answer to that question. I don't think I've heard that one before, but I've heard some very <laughs> interesting replies to that. Well, <laughs> let me give you a proper introduction. We're going to dive into a very fun, many fun things that you're doing. Jeff Mason founded Hero Design Studio and began a career as a designer and entrepreneur. When he and his brother Chris started preparing to race the Carrera Panamericana, it was natural for him to create Driving La Carrera, a podcast and blog to share the stories from their rally racing adventures. In 2018, with Jeff as a navigator and his brother Chris as the driver, they raced that Carrera Panamericana for the first time. They finished the grueling seven-day event in Mexico and fell in love with the race and the spirit of La Carrera. They returned to do it again in 2019, and that race led to making the film a Driving La Carrera Rally Brothers. And since then, they've documented two more teams, including past cars, I guess, Carlo Flores in his GT40. In 2021, Jeff became president and COO of the Piston Foundation, combining his experience as a business owner, entrepreneur, car enthusiast to help the foundation build scholarships and apprenticeship programs that serve the car community. Very cool. We'll be back in just a minute to learn more about Jeff and La Carrera, but first a word from our valued sponsor, so give them a little listen, and we'll be right back. Keep the seatbelt tight. Covercraft makes quality protection for the inside of your vehicles while you're traveling. Their plush custom fit mats or Berber mats turn any ride into something special and are easy to remove and clean after days on the road. Covercraft floor mats are the ultimate protection from moisture, dirt, mud, snow, and slush. Just about anything you can throw at them. Don't forget your vehicle's trunk area too. Their Carhartt custom cargo liners not only look great, but they keep your rear cargo areas and seats protected from the sun and those accidental spills. Custom fit truck liners for sedans, coupes, and SUVs are perfect to protect the factory carpet from all those things that can stain and damage the floors. All your options are quality made, easy to clean, secure to the floor, and look oh so good. Check out Covercraft.com for a wide variety of styles, colors, and options for a custom fit. And I've got a special offer for you. If you use the code ya 21 that's Y-E-A-H-2-1, at Covercraft.com, they'll give you 10% off your Covercraft order. That's right, 10% off. Simply use the code ya 21 at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. Last year, I changed my collector car coverage to American Collectors Insurance. That's who now protects my Porsche Turbo, the one I call my Orange Crush. But did you know they also insure your valuable collections of automobilia and other collectibles. If you're like me, you've invested in a lot of cool collectibles over the years. Those items are valuable. And if you were to lose them in a theft or a fire, well, try to get your normal homeowner's insurance to pay you what they're worth. Good luck with that. American Collectors Insurance provides you with assurance 
and confidence that your collectibles are fully covered. They insure a lot of items, including automobilia, wine, baseball cards, books, figurines, die-cast models, model trains, glassware, sports memorabilia, toys, and a whole lot more. American Collectors Insurance, they've been protecting us enthusiasts since 1976. They provide you with an agreed value insurance policy backed by a long history of taking care of their clients. Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote at 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine, Mark Rains here at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. All right, Jeff, we're back. So let's dive a little deeper into the corner, uh, something you and your brother love to do. I'd love for you to kind of take us on a little walk through your career, though. First, kind of walk through how you got into this. You and I have a similar background, being a graphic design, advertising, the creative field. But you're doing something pretty darn fun with uh, driving La Carrera, combining all these talents of yours. So take it away, or should I say, maybe instead of your brother usually tries, but today I'm going to let you do the driving, so take the wheel. <laughs> Well, thanks. Yeah, as a navigator, I don't uh, I don't get my hands on the wheel, but I do get to tell him what to do. So, <laughs> That's, that uh, might that, be better. That kind of suits me pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've had this very winding path in my career, but as I look back now, it's it kind of starts to make a little sense. I guess that's the uh, the benefits of of age. You know, we had uh, a great childhood growing up, tearing things apart, figuring out how they worked. Bikes were sort of the big thing for me, and that led to running a, a bike shop after college. So I, I really had a deep connection with uh, wrenches in my hands and, yeah. and grease grease under my fingernails. And that was kind of my whole youth. I ended up moving out to Colorado and got involved as a product designer in the outdoor industry that got me interested in uh, graphic design. Somebody had to figure out how to package those, those products. All and right. um, And I decided at that point, that's the path I wanted to take. And so I actually went back to school to get uh, an associate's degree in graphic design. It was really just a just a trade school situation. And I, I sort of had the sense of what I wanted to do and sort of had the eye for it, but I didn't really have the mechanical skills uh, in, in graphics. So I went and did that. And from that founded uh, Hero Design Studio, which is a, a business I still run today. That was sort of, you know, traditional ink on paper design studio for a long time and then sort of evolved into consulting and, and things like that. Yeah. So when we started racing, it was pretty easy for me to say, hey, I'm going to take all my design and marketing skills and let's create Driving La Carrera as a way just to share with our family and friends what we were doing. Brilliant idea. I, you know, I, I love it because a lot of times your brother was mentioning, when, and I've done this too because I raise vintage cars, you come back and you tell people about your weekend and they kind of look at you like, <laughs> okay, yeah. well, whatever. You drove a car. Uh huh. Right, yeah. right. They really, it's hard to convey. And the other thing was we would as we were getting ready for the Carrera, it took us two years from the first idea to wheels on the road. We were getting a lot of help from a lot of people who were explaining the race to us, helping us source and prepare the car, uh, you know, how to prepare ourselves, how to train, how to, how to learn the process of the race. And, you know, I, I thought, well, there's got to be some jokers out there like us who are thinking about doing this. And why don't we just like capture all this information and share it back out to make it easier for the next group to come. And so that was the other motivation for driving La Carrera. And so that's what we did. And that driving La Carrera just continues to grow and grow and grow. We made a, our film in 2019. We couldn't go back to race in 2020 because of the pandemic. The race was run as a bubble and it was very safe, the race itself, but getting back and forth across the border last year would have been... Yeah, maybe you wouldn't have gotten back across the That's border. That's exactly it. There was a lot of question marks as to what would actually happen. So we decided uh, that instead we would um, kind of continue to build Driving La Carrera and we followed two teams who are racing the race and with the intent of, of developing a film from that. And uh, we did that. We released, we just released the second film about a month ago. That one's called Carrera Passion. Nice. It's about uh, Angelica Fuentes and uh, Gabriel Perez racing uh, a Studebaker, 58 Studebaker. And they were racing for the win. And it was, uh, I think Angelica has raced the race 25 times. Mm -hmm. She's a very, very accomplished international navigator. 
the other film uh, was GT40 Panamericano, which was about Carlo Flores yeah. and his uh, GT40 replica, which was the first GT40 to race in the race. And the, the story there is not only that beautiful car, but, you know, to turn a track car into a Carrera car is a really big undertaking. And, yes. and it took Carlo a few years to do it. But he, you know, it's such a well sorted car. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's just great to see that thing running on the Mexican roads. So, yeah. And he was a guest here on cars. Yeah. And, and told us all about it. And I, I was thinking, you know, I asked him, I said, Carlo, to take a car like that, that really is an endurance racer, but not really designed to be maybe mm-hmm. like a Porsche 911 or, um, but I'll tell you some of the cars, including you and your brother, that people race in this race, I just roll my eyes and go, really? Seriously? Yeah. How did you turn that into a race car? Now your father was an amateur stock car racer. So you've got a little bit of racing in the genes. I think we do. Yeah. He, he wasn't in our lives growing up, but we were kind of aware of that. And, uh, that combined with our own natural tendency to, to find something to go fast on, whether it's a, a bike, a go-kart, a mini bike, a, a muscle car, that was sort of, that was how we spent our youth. <laughs> yeah. So all that combined kind of, kind of set us up for this adventure. The car most, you know, even if you took a 911, you, know, you see a lot of 911s, it's a great car for the Carrera, but you know, to get a stock 911 to be a Carrera car is still an extraordinary journey because the race is so difficult on the machinery itself that they really are no longer good for, for any other racing. I mean, you would have to then convert that back to something that was, you know, worthy of the track or you could convert it to a dirt rally car more easily. But by the time you've actually sorted a Carrera car, that's what it is. It's a, it's a road rally car. Very specific. Very, yeah, they do end up being very, very specific because of the combination of the difficulty of the roads, the endurance aspect of it, and then the heat, uh, oh, which yeah. is <laughs> more extreme than, than you find in, in, it's more akin to what you might see in, in world rally when they're racing Mexico or Argentina, you know, those kind of high altitude, hot, uh, races. Now with what you and your brother do, he does the driving, you're the navigator. I watch say world rally or these rally races and it's absolutely incredible. And you always hear the navigator yelling off instructions of what's coming down the road. So the driver knows what's coming up. I, I can't imagine how challenging that must be because you're, re- he's really putting everything in your hands to make sure that you really do know what's coming down the road. Yeah. And you don't tell him to turn left when he's supposed to go right, uh, right off the edge of a mountain or something like that. How did you become the navigator? Like what, kind of things did you have to learn to do properly so that that communication and boy communication is important in everything in life but in this race it's life and death yeah you're right it it, it certainly it certainly can feel that way and i think for uh you know in the past it certainly has been so navigating well when chris and i started we had this conception that we would trade off navigating and driving and as we got up to the 2018 race that just became we just realized that wasn't the way to do it. And I just said, look, I'm going to take on this piece. Uh, I really wanted to drive, but being honest with myself, you know, Chris has always been the faster driver. He still is today. He's just, he's just better the, uh, behind the wheel than me. Uh, so I said, look, let me, I'll take on this piece. But I also knew it kind of, uh, went to my natural, uh, abilities and, you know, kind of organizing things. And, uh, as a business owner, of course, you know, we all know about that kind of stuff. But it was a whole different challenge. So how do we develop that? So really, it's it's seat time and being in it. We did some pre-race prep where we had um, some rally notes that were up in New England. And we did did a, a few uh, runs uh, just getting used to working with the trip meters. So we've got two Terra trip meters that calculate our distance and our speed. And so you gotta you got to understand the mechanics of those devices because they're essential for knowing, you know, that you're en route in the race. So that was one big part of it, literally like watching rally videos and just getting an understanding of what was happening in the car. And then the rest was really kind of learned in race. And uh, when we first went down, we had a lot of help from a few really generous teams uh, who, you know, wanted to see us succeed in the race and, and have a good time. So they helped, helped us get square on the, the rules and all of the time controls and things like that. But we literally, I remember two afternoons in our hotel room in Mexico with the rule book, 
saying, okay, we're going to learn this time control system because it's, it's similar to others, but also unique to the Carrera. So we, you know, we literally sort of pretended we were sort of in a car going through these controls step by step and what would happen next and what would we have to do and just to get it square in our heads as, as yeah. to what we do. Because you can learn, you, you can lose so much time with navigation mistakes that it, and they compound. And, oh, they do. They really do compound. Um, one wrong turn can end up, you know, with a 15 minute arriving 15 minutes late. And that's a severe penalty. So, so we did, so we did all we could beyond that. The other big thing for a navigator is preparing the, the route books. And so the Carrera is a rally, which they provide you, uh, the route books and the pace notes. So the route book is what we use on the transit stages. It's all combined into one, but there's sort of different styles. So the transit stages you're getting from point A to point B, point B being the start of a speed stage. And those are turn by turn directions based on, you know, major markers. And, you know, it's sort of like navigating. It's not by map, but sort of like Google directions, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's that, but it's very difficult to um, make sure that, you know, you're, you know, you're turning at the right place. And so that's why we've got the, the trip computers the thing about those is you have to watch out for the dangers. And so the big dangers are, you know, number one, missing missing turns. So you got to make sure you understand exactly where like the key moments are. And so you've got to mark up your book so you know that what you're doing. And then the other big things are like topes, what we call speed bumps. Yeah, uh, topes. They are u- <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. They are used throughout Mexico as speed control devices coming in and out of towns. And, you know, they range from that's a little bump to, Hey, that's going to rip your differential out. Oh, and so yeah. Holy cow. You, you cannot, you know, to miss one of these and hit it at speed, you know, can be a race ending event. So the navigator is responsible for spotting those and they're marked in the book, but they're not easy to see. And you've got to know, you know, if there's a, if it's 200 meters to a tope, you've got, you know, as a navigator, I've got to have my eyes and up. on the brakes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, my God. Carlo talked about that in that little GT40, how low and how they had to adjust the car because the ride height, some of them, they literally couldn't get over. They were so steep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's true. And there's some of them that are just monstrous. Um, and so there's that piece of it, marking up the book and learning to mark up the book so that you can read it for yourself and for your driver. That's a big thing. And I think I actually posted some videos about that. Someone could go to our YouTube channel and find those. Uh, you know, every navigator develops their own system, color coding and underlining and the things that are most important to you in the way that you you call the the turns inside the speed stages. Now that's, you know, we're calling the entries and the exits and the, the type of turn and the distances between. So that's, you know, we're really calling kind of every meter of the road for the driver. And again, there's a language about uh, turns that are separate. So, you know, if I said, you know, right one, long exit, 200, right two. Well, Chris knows exactly the shape of that turn. And he knows there's a distance between those turns because I said 200, right two. And he'll know he can carry some speed out of that, Mm. out of that first turn, that right one. But if I said right one into right two, long exit, then he knows that the into means that those turns are connected and he's not. So it's going to change the way he sets up the car because if if he's got 200 after the right one, he knows he can wind it out, but he also knows he can take a little more road and get the car. Then he's got time to set the car for the next turn. If I say into, he knows that the exit of one has got to prepare the car for the entry of two. So there's lots of little language nuances in navigator speak that the driver and the navigator work out so he knows, you know, how things are connected because that's the piece he can't see. Yeah, communication, wow, is key, absolutely. I watched a rally race a long, long time ago. I was actually in Europe and they had this really cool rally simulator machine that you climbed into. Mm -hmm. And I remember one, you're the driver and you had somebody yelling off instructions and they gave you this little, (laughs) and I remember at one point, the guy, and it was designed this way to get you to crash, is the guy says, right turn, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember like, maybe, what? <laughs> right, and it wasn't, a, wasn't a right turn, it was a left there turn. There are no maybes. Yeah, you got, no, no maybes in uh, rally racing for sure. Let's talk about uh, driving inspiration. Uh, somebody who's, who's been a key mentor for you, who's that person? 
Well, we've been talking a lot about him, but I'm going to bring him up again. My brother. Ah, Chris. Nice. Yeah, Chris, we, uh, we grew up without a father in our lives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've throughout the years relied on each other for a lot of things, but he's also been a real inspiration to me. For some reason, the two of us have always just believed we can do anything we want, which was sort of like, like we could, if we want to do it, we can, we can do it. And it was sort of the reason we thought, you know, we could run a, 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 endurance race across Mexico. But, you know, it's a, it's an ethos that he taught me. And what it boils down to is, you know, it's not so much about the winning or the losing, it's the doing. Yeah. And if you want to do it, you just do it and you don't have to worry. You don't have to wait for permission. You don't have to worry about the rules, uh, you know, that say, oh, you're a person who shouldn't do that. You, um, you just do it. And, you know, that's, you know, through the years, we've done some, some pretty cool things together traveling the world, racing, and we've stayed really close. Nice. You know, I think a lot of people get hung up on what they should or shouldn't do or what they, they think they could do or what they've never considered doing. And I think it, for us or for me, it really boils down to what I learned from Chris was, you know, all you really need is the will. To, you need a will to do something that's bigger than the fear to do it. Yeah. Right. You yeah. got to want it more than you fear it. If you can give yourself permission to want it, then you can you can find the courage you know to get over the fear of it. You know, Chris is like I said, he's he's lived that. I could recount zillions of things he does he's done in his life that kind of oh, represent. Yeah, that. went off to Italy to live and work. I mean, who does? I that? know. Yeah, who does that? <laughs> who does that? I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I thought, well, what can I do over here? Oh, I kind of like woodworking and old stuff. I think I'll do that. Yeah, let me give that a try. Oh, yeah. by the way, hey brother, let's go race in Mexico. What? Who is this? <laughs> it's, That's yeah, right. What That's a right. nice. That's uh, much how it happened. Yeah. yeah on both well, accounts. what a great guy to have in your life. You're very, very fortunate. Let's take a little pit stop here. Pull in. Watch out for those uh, speed bumps and we're going to thank our sponsors we'll be back and we're going to hit a big speed bump talk about a challenge maybe even a failure so keep the seatbelts on we'll be right back what began as a charitable car show has grown into the world's greatest collector car auctions raising over 133 million for charitable organizations to date for nearly 50 years automotive enthusiasts from all over the world have enjoyed the barrett jackson collector car auctions And I'm a huge fan. Regarded as the barometer of the collector car industry, their auctions are world-class lifestyle events where thousands of the world's most sought-after unique and valuable automobiles cross the block in front of a global audience, in person, on TV, or streamed online. Barrett Jackson produces the world's greatest collector car auctions in Scottsdale, Arizona, Palm Beach, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada, and new for 2021, Houston, Texas. And be sure to visit BarrettJackson.com today. Barrett Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auctions. How did you discover your path to a fulfilling life? Too many young people flounder in finding an education and a career that fits. But for those who have a passion for cars, trucks, and motorcycles, and who love working with their hands, problem solving, and fixing things, a career as a professional auto technician is incredibly rewarding. Cars Yeah! is pleased to team up with TechForce Foundation, our charity of choice in bringing scholarships, technical education, and hands-on experience to young people so they can discover a possible future. Join me and lend your support by visiting techforce.org today. So let's talk about that big challenge, big speed bump that perhaps you've hit in your life, something that you had to overcome. But more importantly, what was that lesson learned so it could become a positive lesson for you? Yeah. I mean, I think, well, I'll come back to the Carrera because, uh, yeah, that's uh, no kidding, <laughs> but it really has, it really has been one of the biggest challenges in my life. And I remember when I came back from 2018, talking with a friend, you know, trying to describe what this thing was, I remember saying, you know, it really was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, it was such a monumental challenge for me for that first time. Um, but of course that's really, you know, what I loved about it, you know, that's sort of what kind of what I live for. I I love things like that. Um, but you know, in a rally seven days, 2000 miles, a lot of stuff goes wrong and ultimately it's how you deal with it. You know, the, the problems that come up that determine success or failure. So, you know, one of the great things about it is you have this for that when you're in the car, you have just this singular focus. All you're trying to do is get to the finish line. 
everything else goes away and that's your only goal. That's the only thing you need to think about. And if you have a problem, the solution is really simple. It becomes self-evident. The solution is always what gets me to the finish line fastest, because that's all that matters when I'm in the rally. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep your focus, then you can achieve that. And the big challenge that we had in 2019 when we went back is, um, we crashed the car in qualifying. So I and, heard. Yeah. Yeah. Chris didn't take his own advice. I was a little rusty and behind on the notes and I should have, I, sh I had some responsibility. I really should have pulled him back and, and said, Hey man, you gotta, you gotta slow down here. But I was a little bit behind, um, not feeling on top of my game. And so he was able to kind of run free. Yeah. So we put it off the road and it's, it was funny months later, <clears throat> as we started working on the film for that, our producer, Julian found the audio that was recorded in the car at that moment. And he came, he said, Hey man, I found this. I don't know if you want to listen to this. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll listen to it. He said, the thing that's really, that blew me away is how calm you are. Oh, cool. You just put the car off and yet, you know, you're just calmly giving Chris instructions. And that came back to this, you know, how you get through these challenges. So that was a huge challenge, but I knew right in that moment, the only way we we're going to get past it is to keep focused on the finish line and right. that it's like, okay, the car's got to get back to the crew as fast as possible. How do we do that? Because we're now, you know, we're now at risk of not being able to start tomorrow if we can't get this car fixed. Yeah. And I had learned from the previous year, like, okay, that's, this, this is now the most important thing. It doesn't matter. There'll be time to sort the feelings about what, you, what just happened later. But right now we got to get the car back to the crew so we can get this repaired. And so that, you know, getting out the, the challenges there really teach you, uh, and you know, th your mistakes really teach you. And I, I, I keep this document, this, we started this document with a team called things Jeff says, <laughs> which is like, <laughs> I like it. it's like, yeah, there's these things I would say. And Julian was like, Oh my God, I got to remember that. And I was like, so I literally start, we have a, like a Dropbox where we do all our work with the team. And oh. I, I have, there's a document in there called things Jeff things says. And, Jeff says. <laughs> and, um, one of them is a failure is a loss until you make it a teacher. Ah, I love that. I and love that it. was that moment. It's like, okay, the failure is you put the car off. You weren't supposed to do that. Right. But now you got to figure out, you know, how to turn that into a teaching moment. How do you turn that into something that you can use later on? And, and it was those 2018 problems that really solidified that. And the, the thing you, you know, the, what I learned from them is you got to, you got to stay focused on getting to the finish line. That's the only thing in rally. That's the only thing you're worried about. Uh, so I can see a little, the little handbook of things Jeff says, <laughs> yeah, I know. maybe someday there'll be enough in there to, to publish. Yeah. Uh, I, had, I had an old friend. In fact, we just had lunch last week. I've known him for, we couldn't believe it. We've known each other for 40 years. We lived in Southern California. We we're neighbors down there. He moved up here a year before I did. And we're kind of far apart. So we don't see each other as much, but it's fun when you come across somebody that you uh, haven't seen in a long time and you start right back where you began, but now we're yeah. both grandparents and, you know, it's just weird. I mean, our kids, we knew each other before our kids were born. And I remember a birthday card I made for him, uh, Pete's sayings, because he had all these oh, silly, yeah. crazy sayings. He was a salesman. He just had a great gift of communication. And uh, I think that's certainly something you have too, Jeff. So maybe we'll do a combination, Jeff's and Pete's muses uh, and sayings. So how about a bucket list in your life? Now, you've, you've accomplished some amazing bucket list items, just going to Mexico and racing and then creating films about it, documentaries. Any other bucket list items for you? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's some around that. There's also, you know, some professional goals. One of the things in, as far as career, I, I actually didn't get to is, you know, all my career as a, as a designer and then getting involved in the Carrera and starting driving like that have really brought me much, much closer to, you know, the car community and, and, you know, my love of, of, of cars and being an enthusiast about it. And so in 2020, I joined the Piston Foundation I'm now taking the role of, of president and COO of that organization. And, and that organization is focused on providing funding for skilled trade education for students and uh, auto technicians, apprentices who want to have a career in the collector car world. You know, there's a huge graying of that industry and we need to get young people in to, you know, learn those skills and keep those skills alive. And so the Piston Foundation has some big, uh, big goals and I'm charged with achieving those, but they're, you know, they're really tied to, you know, what I want to achieve in my life. So uh, we're looking to raise 
raise fifty million Whoa. in five in the next five years wow. uh, to to fund education, and that's going to provide scholarships and apprenticeships for 4,000 students. So a bucket list for me is definitely to uh, achieve that that uh, fundraising goal and uh, make that impact in the American car community. So um, I'm real focused on that now. And of course, it's it's a great organization with a great team. So we're really enjoying the work. Very, there. very important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love yeah, it. Yeah. I love it. Let's talk about a special vehicle story, special vehicle in your life. This could be a car, a bike, a truck, could be the car you guys raced the La Carrera in. Well, I do love the Mescalero, but it's not, it's not the car that has my heart right now. I had a friend in high school who who eventually bought this 80s Porsche 914. It, the thing was a rust bucket. It had it had more holes in the floorboards than it had places for your feet. But <laughs> I will never forget the first ride in that car on the back roads of Jersey, through the mountains, through the woods. Chris had always he was a muscle car guy and he had a he had a Chevelle uh, for a long time. So a lot of the cars I knew were they were really fast, but only in a straight line. Right, right. <laughs> so Very like, different than a 914. Right. And so that I, I can literally just close my eyes and put myself back in that passenger seat. I think I was literally like holding my feet off the floor so I didn't step too hard on the rust spots. But it, to me, like that was what a sports car was supposed to be, you know, a fast car. That's what it was supposed to be. And so that car for me, so it's now sort of formalized into a a, a 74 Porsche 914 1.8. That is the car for me. And I am, I am, uh, I haven't bought mine yet, but I'm getting real close. I'm almost at a point where I can, where I can do it. Yeah, you better hurry up because those things are like, well, all used cars right now are kind of crazy, crazy land. But uh, I had a 73 2.0 uh, for a while that <clears throat> was a great, fun little car. And like you, I had a good friend in high school whose parents bought him one. I remember it was kind of mm-hmm. a lime green color. It was a oh, really, yeah. yep. really crazy color. And he would let me drive that thing. And we lived in Southern California at the beach. So it was so fun to take the, I don't think the top was ever on that thing just take it off and right. cruise yep, around yep. but uh yeah or uh, you could get really crazy and find a 914.6 that would be the one to have but those have become kind of unobtainium they've become very very yeah pricey. they have yeah they have but fun cars i don't need the six to actually relive my moment you know <laughs> yeah, like sure. I, i'll be able to enjoy it in a four and then probably i'll turn uh, i'll uh, flip the four for a six <laughs> but, yeah, yeah there you go or but, drop a six in it but you know what was fun yeah. when i had mine was you'd go to a gas station and i had mine uh, oh well over 10 years ago it was a beautiful kind of a uh, beach blue ocean blue color mm-hmm. and uh, people would come up a lot of people didn't even know what it was I'm like, what is yeah. this it's a porsche i've never seen a porsche like this uh you know for i've been around for a, a long time so i remember them when they first came out but uh they're really really fun cars great cars to take uh, uh to a track and drive not yeah. super fast but really fun and handle like a go-kart and you're so close to the ground. So yeah, I'll, I can't wait for you to send me a, email me a picture of that thing. When that happens. Yeah. Yeah. We had the Mescalero down at Roebling Road in Savannah for uh, for some testing two years ago. We were part of a larger kind of driver's event there. And uh, one of the, one of the drivers had a 914 uh, that he had just finished. It was, a, and it was built as a, as a track car, SCCA car. And uh, man, it was that and that was sort of like the nail in the coffin for me because I was like <laughs> yeah. I was like oh yeah this is this is really what I want and uh, unfortunately he was he was too t- he was pretty tall yeah. so there was no chance for me to actually get in and uh, and take it for a lap but seeing a nine fourteen as a track car completely race prepped was like yeah that's it. That was that was the last one. No doubt there'll be one in your garage one day. Now, I'm going to crawl into your head here a little bit, be a psychologist, psychiatrist. If you were manifest as a vehicle, Jeff, what would you be and why? Well, I thought about that. That's a really tricky question. And <laughs> yep. uh, I, I thought about this a while. And and I came what I came up with was 2004 Volkswagen R32. Ooh, nice. I had a lot of Volkswagens uh, through the years, um, including some some Golfs. And for me, the reason would be is I prefer to be underestimated when possible. And I think the R32 was always that. You know, it was very this very plain wrapper, and you could easily look at it and just like ah, that's just a Golf. 
but no, no, no. It, it was an Audi <laughs> TT underneath the hood. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I love that car because it was, because it was that kind of sleeper and that, kind of represents the way I, I like to operate. A lot of them were in that really cool blue color too that you saw the mm -hmm. Audi R's cars, the the fours back in the day, the wagons that everyone wanted, they weren't importing here. Yep. Same kind of feeling about that car, kind of a stealthy sleeper car. I was in Europe in 96 picking up a Porsche at the factory and I remember stopping at an Autobahn. Along those Autobahns, they have these like rest stations you stop mm -hmm. off and they have full restaurants there. And they're, they're it's kind of like the Jersey uh, Turnpike. Yeah. Like the yeah, Garden State yeah. Turnpike. Which I grew up in the West Coast. We don't have them here. So I'm like, why is there this little village right by the freeway? Yeah, this it is, is yeah, weird. it is like a little village. But I remember stopping in there one time and there was a guy with a uh, Volkswagen Golf with a 928 Porsche engine in it <laughs> because he he had passed us a ways back and just was yeah. flying. I'm like, how is that car going so damn fast? Yeah. And we pull, he goes, pull over. I was with a friend. Pull over. We got to check this out. Yeah, I had a 928 engine stuffed in that thing. You know, V8 just... Oh my gosh. It was yeah. like super cool. Super cool. Well, we already talked about how you give back with uh, the Piston Foundation. We'll put links to the Piston, Piston Foundation so people can learn more about that. I think it's great what you guys are doing. My charity of choice here is uh, Tech Force Foundation, which is mm -hmm. very similar yep. in many ways than the RPM Foundation. Uh, so I, I love the fact that together we're able to bring young people into the trade, into the, the business, kind of a Mike Rogue type thing that, hey, it's okay to come and work uh, in these jobs. I like the the way I think it's the uh, the tech force that says it's not a blue collar job, it's a new collar job. Oh, I hadn't I hadn't heard that. We yeah, we definitely know tech force, and you know they're doing good work too, and have for a while. There's some different areas to work in, and and you know Mike Rowe has got a great a great foundation going that is really working across all the trades, mm -hmm. whether that's electrical or plumbing or or construction. Uh, engineering and tech force, they're preparing a lot of kids uh, for kind of the, the more mainstream automotive careers that, you know, with dealerships and independent shops and getting, getting young technicians trained for, for those roles. And those are critical with us. We're, we're more, we're, what we're seeing, the, the, the place we're seeing a loss, a potential loss of, of skill is in the collector car world, in the restoration world, in, yeah, yeah. in the mechanics who can keep a 74 Porsche or even, you know, even, you know, a, a 2004 R32, that's no longer a car that you're really going to take to a dealership anymore. Right. And so you really need, and, and yet it, this, all that body of car skills, car craft, that is applicable to uh, a Radwood car, you know, like, yeah. like you like that or your older exotic cars, your, your classics, your Ferraris, your alphas, that body of skill that those trade skills are disappearing quickly because those mechanics and those craftspeople are retiring. Yeah. And what's happened is, you know, we've devalued trade skill careers for 20 years in America. And we, you know, we told every kid that it was college at any cost. That was, that was the way to do it. And so there's been two generations that haven't come into those industries. And so they, they've got to, they're graying out. And w the problem is, and I, I, I say, you know, the biggest threat to the collector car world is a 65 year old cross person who's about to retire because they retire and their skills retire with them. And we don't have the youth there to, transition that, to be that apprentice, to transition those skills uh, to the next generation. And so the Piston Foundation works both to get young people into those trade schools, get them into uh, a tech school for that first couple of years that they need to get started. But then we're really focused on getting those young people who want to a path into those shops where they can learn those craft skills and, and be in the collector car world. And we don't know how, how long will, you know, combustion engines last we don't know i don't care if ferraris all go to electric somebody's got to maintain those cars though somebody needs there's a lot of skills that are well beyond you know part replacement that are needed to maintain those cars i believe that heritage is valuable and the foundation does as well so that's what we're working on and it's a complement to what tech force and rpm are doing just a different a, a, a little more laser focused. 
and it is because, you know, depending on how you measure it, you could say there's a crisis in that industry and, and the skills gap. What is absolutely true, the, the, the skill gap is getting wider and wider and wider. And we're looking to to build programs to to close that. And it's great. I've had hundreds of guests on the show that have businesses in that area and they all talk about that challenge. It's uh, huge. Last time I was down at Bruce Canopy shop, I was talking with yeah. them about a, looking at a Porsche 917 racing engine. I said, who's going to know how to work on these mm-hmm. in the future. And he goes, mm-hmm. it's a big worry. So yeah, it's great what you guys are doing. I love uh, what you guys are doing. It's so, so important for, for the hobby and the trade. Let's go on the ultimate drive. Uh, you've already been on some pretty ultimate drives, but this one, you get to choose whatever car you want, whoever you're going to be with and where you're going to be going. So what does it look like for you? All right. Th- this is, this is uh, simple. My, my dr- r- racing hero is Paul Newman. And for the simple fact is just like me, he started in his mid Mm forties and, you know, and he went on to, uh, be really, really successful in what he did. And so my ultimate drive would, would, uh, be, uh, show up to Paul's house in a, uh, 78 Datsun 280Z that sort of that, that remember that there was that last, it was really the last year, the last model they made it in black. It was sort of the end of that era. And Paul had been so successful in those, in those Nissans for in his racing career. So I'd say, Hey, I'd get out of the driver's seat, jump to passenger, say you drive. And we just take that thing. I think we'd take some back roads through Connecticut up to Lime Rock, do a few hot laps, uh, (laughs) <laughs> find our way, find our way back through the country roads. Um, but you know, I'd love to just chat with him about his experience because I think, you know, if I talk about like that lesson that I learned from my brother, which is, Hey, if you want to do something, you just do it and don't worry, don't wait for somebody else's permission around that. And you just have to have more ambition than fear. And I think for me, Paul Newman definitely, definitely embodies that, you know, I, I think it was a tremendous risk for him as a successful actor to then go racing. I mean, I, oh, yeah. I you know, I'm surprised the studios even allowed it. <laughs> Adam Carolla's film winning picks up on that piece, you know, and, and his struggles to, uh, to be allowed to do that kind of racing. And so, uh, but he just, you know, I, he just did it. Yeah. And, and uh, so I, I love that about it. He would, he would be, uh, my ultimate drive for sure. That would be fun. Well, your thoughts here are a nice segue to a final question I have for you. And that is a parting piece of wisdom, guidance, a success quote, maybe a mantra that you could share with us. Oh, I'm going to go back to my, <laughs> my things Jeff says document because, uh, I seem to capture all my, all my nuggets there. Um, there's a couple of things that we in the team always, um, always say. And one of them, um, when you talk about failures, things that go wrong, uh, I always say, you know, if you're driving fast enough to win, you're driving fast enough to crash. Mm. (laughs) And that's, that's just the way it is. And you, so if you, if you want to, if you want to work hard enough to win, you've got to accept that you could very easily end off the road as well. And right. that's the line you've got to cross. And it's okay. If you crash, it's okay. Because if you don't crash, were you really, were you really at the limit? Yeah. So that's uh great, great saying, great thought process. You knew it comes to mind when you say that is Elon Musk and uh, the edges that he has pushed, especially in mm-hmm. the SpaceX program and Tesla for that matter. I mean, how many sure. times have people said he's going to fail? And uh, oh, when those, really? those yeah. first three rockets came back and exploded or didn't even get off the launch pad. And everybody said, oh, you're crazy. You'll never do anything and, and look where he's gone. So yeah, dare to fail. That's for sure. How can yeah. more people learn about Hero Design Studio, Piston Foundation, and Driving La Carrera? Well, Driving La Carrera is the easiest. Uh, you can find it at drivinglacarrera.com. And so for those of us who don't speak Spanish, a Carrera is C-A-R-R-E-R-A. And so drivinglacarrera.com is, is the website. And then you can find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, uh, YouTube, at Driving La Carrera. Our films are there on our website and on our YouTube channel. So that's, uh, if you want to watch uh, GT40 Panamericano, uh, that's the place to do it. Uh, the Piston Foundation is at pistonfoundation.org. Uh, also on social media, uh, at Piston Foundation. And you can learn about uh, the programs, the scholarship and apprenticeship programs that we're putting together to get more young people uh, into the collector car industry. Very nice. And how about Hero Design Studio? Is it herodesignstudio.com? 
It is. We try to keep it simple here at designstudio.com. And of course, if anybody wants to reach me uh, directly, uh, Jeff at pistonfoundation.org is the place to do that. Very cool. Listeners, you can find everything on Jeff's show notes page on the Cars yeah website. Everything is listed there with quick, easy links. A uh, quick shout out and a thank you to your brother, Chris, for connecting me with Jeff today. Thank you, Chris. If any of you listeners missed my talk with him, you got to go back and listen to it. You can hear the other side of the family. Definitely two brothers that love each other dearly are having the time of their lives. Uh, that's what everybody should be doing today. Uh, that's what Cars yeah is all about. Jeff, thanks for being so generous today with your time, your expertise, and sharing your experiences with me and the listeners today. Until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you either down the road or at Carrera Lock or Panamericana. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here with you. This was fun. Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on firsthand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions, ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. And be sure to use the code CARS yeah when you subscribe, and they'll give you $10 off. Boom! Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.